Thank you, Douglas, for laying a foundation that I'll just pick up on. Actually, I'll talk about something a little bit different than I was planning to because I think that there's something deep to Douglas's observation in a discussion about meritocracy, to talk about the relationship between merit or the loss of merit and this new acidine, listlessness in American society. I'll tell you actually when I launched this presidential campaign, one of the things that I said was it was time to put the merit back into America. And I'm a big believer that language often teaches us something about the truth of what language actually describes. And so I was convinced that there was going to be actually a linguistic tie between even the word merit and America. It just seems so part of the fabric of what it meant to be American that the coincidence seemed too convenient that these two things were, were even similar sounding. So I did a little homework in, in the weeks thereafter. I first got to a disappointing conclusion. Actually, in the first instance, they didn't have the same linguistic origin. America was named after, in part, there's actually competing explanations, but Amerigo Vespucci, the famous explorer, one of the first people to come to the Western Hemisphere. And Amerigo Vespucci was named in turn after his grandfather, and that name derived actually from uh, his old, his grandfather, his name was derived from a Gothic word called Amalric. So it seemed like I was out of luck there. But then I got to the heart of what does Amalric mean, actually. Amalric is, is two words. Rick means master, okay, it means the master, but then the master of what? Amal actually stands for work. So, so if you think about the root and the genesis of the American name itself, it is he who is the master of work itself. And to me, the idea of work, hard work, effort as a means to achieving success is actually inextricably linked to that idea of merit in itself. And so I think that there was a way in which even the language teaches us the way in which merit is itself part of the American fabric. I think that I'll rise to hopefully address the challenge that Douglas laid out for our movement at the end of his remarks, which is that we have spent enough time in our movement, myself included, even Douglas too, if I'm to call both of us out, on pointing out the endless hypocrisies of the other side in identifying the way in which the weight of the left's own hypocrisies crumble under the weight of its nonsense. But I think that now is the moment where we rise to the occasion to provide an affirmative alternative vision of our own, because as that Wall Street Journal survey last week demonstrated, we are in the middle of this national identity crisis, where if you ask most people our age, really any age in this country, what does it mean to be American? What does it mean to be meritocratic? You get a blank stare in response. And I think that's evidence of the fact that we've lost the sources of identity that used to fill our hunger for purpose and meaning as a generation. And I think that's what creates this black hole of a void that allows wokeism or gender ideology or for that matter, climatism or COVIDism new secular cults that arise one at a time to fill that void, to prey on that void, where I think we can actually fill that void with the answer to the question of what it even means to be an American in the year 2023. And if we can do that, then we dilute these alternative ideologies to irrelevance. And my view is the heart of what it means to be American is that you believe in merit. I'm going to make a, a strong claim here I think that merit is the unifying idea that actually gives us our American identity and it shows up in many different spheres of our lives. It does mean it's woven into the fabric of the American dream. The idea that no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is, that you can achieve anything in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, and your own dedication. That is the heart of the American dream. And while we as conservatives, me as a presidential candidate, will say, that we will get rid of affirmative action in America and race-based affirmative action. That's something that, by the way, we can end in this country with the stroke of a pen from the White House. That's something that can be done. Why do we want to do it? It's because race-based affirmative action is itself an assault on the character of our national soul. It is anti-meritocratic at its core. Now, that much is obvious. 
But the case I'd like to make is that that idea of merit shows up in other spheres of our lives in ways that might not be obvious either. Take our commitment to free speech in this country. A big part of what's enshrined in our, not just the protections against the government intrusion on individual liberty, but in the culture of free speech that our founding fathers set into motion, was actually a commitment to the meritocracy of ideas itself. What does that mean? What is merit in the realm of ideas? It means the best ideas win, but the best ideas only win when no ideas are censored. Right? You think about what was the best idea in how to deal with the unknown COVID pandemic. It was unknown. None of us knew exactly what that was going to look like in the first few months of that pandemic. Well, now we know in retrospect that some of the best ideas would have included leaving our schools open, even if we were taking steps to protect elder Americans. But that idea couldn't win. The best ideas cannot win when some ideas are censored. So that, too, is, I think, something that our founders knew. And that's not a different topic relating to free speech and constitutional liberty. I would make the case that merit is a common thread that runs through that very idea. What does meritocracy and government mean? Think about a different sphere of what the Constitution enshrines. Part of what we enshrined in 1776 in this country was that the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the people who actually run the government. <laughs> That's what's enshrined in a three-part constitutional division of labor. And so what does merit mean there? Merit means that you earn whoever is best at earning the trust as amalgamated and counted in the form of votes, is most meritocratically suited to actually run the country. I speak to you on a day where whatever you think of the man, we have a prosecutor that's trying to intervene in that system and saying the people of this country should not be given that choice. An administrative state in this town that actually views the elected officials that sit at the White House down the street as an inconvenience because it is the unelected class that today actually holds the keys to power. Yes, that goes to the idea of self-governance over aristocracy, but I think this idea of merit itself is woven into the American fabric even in ways that you wouldn't think about it, not just in the American dream, but in our culture of free speech, not just in our culture of free speech, but even in the way we set up our system of constitutional self-governance in this country. I'll tell you, as a first-generation American, as the kid of immigrants who came to this country, this is personal to me. My dad came to this country in the late 1970s, not with a lot of money in his pocket, very little actually, to southwest Ohio where, you know, I, was, I grew up as a skinny kid with nerdy glasses and a funny last name. And I'll tell you, everybody runs into their version of hardship, but part of what my parents taught me was that hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. Hardship is part of what teaches you who you really are. See, did I stand out? I went to a, actually it was majority black or close to majority black, not all that well to do public school from first through eighth grade. You know, got bullied around a little bit as a nerdy academic kid that was focused on science and math as my parents, you know, I think gratefully now pushed me to be. My dad had a saying for me. He said, if you're going to stand out, you might as well be outstanding. And for me, achievement was my ticket to get ahead in this country, to then become the kid of immigrants who came to this country with almost no money, to go on to found multi-billion dollar companies, and then to hopefully pass on those same values to my children. That's deeply personal to me, but it's not just personal to me as a first-generation American. I think no American actually hears the word merit for the first time if they're raised in the American way. They already know it in the way that they were raised and brought up. And I think that's a big part of the shared national identity that we've lost. So when you hear a survey, and I'll close with this before we go to our conversation, in the Wall Street Journal that says we've lost our sense of patriotism, what does that actually mean? It means that we've been tricked, and I think we have been, it's a form of being duped. We've been duped, we've been tricked into celebrating not just equity, but the philosophy embedded in equity, diversity, capital D, diversity, to celebrate all of the ways in which we are different in ways that caused us to forget all of the ways in which we are really the same, bound together by 
a common set of principles that set this nation into motion 250 years ago. That's what's enshrined in the bottom of every one of the coins that embody in physical form the system of what capitalism represents. At the bottom of every one of those coins says, e pluribus unum, from many, one. And I think one of the things that makes it difficult for, even when I'm talking to young people, explaining what those common set of ideals are is on one hand, there's so many of them. Free speech, self-governance over aristocracy, the rule of law. We can go down the, each of the amendments in the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, and explain what that means to them. But I've found that actually one of the easier ways to explain it is sometimes you can just give them the one common thread that runs through the whole thing, and that is this idea of merit and restoring meritocracy in every sphere of our lives from the economy to education to who runs the government to even which ideas win. And I am confident that if we're able to put that merit back into America, that's not just about allowing and creating a culture that allows people to thrive and achieve their greatest dreams through the system of capitalism or any other. But it is also, I think, our best chance of reviving a missing national identity when we long for one. So thank you for your time this morning, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and diving deeper with Douglas. Thank you.